Christ is born. Let the whole world rejoice. Welcome to the online gathering for Salmonach Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining me. Merry Christmas. I trust that over the past several days you've been enjoying um, a wonderful Christmas celebration. Christmas is a season. It's just not one day. The tradition of the church offers us 12 days of Christmas. Those aren't the 12 days before Christmas. Those are the 12 days of Christmas. And December 25th is the first day of the Christmas season. So we're going to spend a couple of weeks continuing to celebrate the good news, the joyful news that the angels proclaim to the shepherds that unto us a Savior has been born. Hallelujah. That's the only announcement that matters these days. We're called to worship on this first Sunday of the Christmas season by Isaiah chapter 61, verses 10 through 62, verse 3. Isaiah 61, verse 10 through the third verse of chapter 62. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give you. You shall be a crown of beauty in the land of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This is God's word. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the new light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light, enkindled in our hearts, may shine forth in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Kind Father, your love for the world is demonstrated by the sending of your Son. We rejoice with joy that is given to us by the Holy Spirit that unto us a Savior has been born. Father, thank you for looking upon the world. Thank you for looking upon us helpless and hopeless in our sin. Thank you for looking upon us with favor and doing this great work of transformation through giving your son, King, as the hymn says, Lord at his birth. We worship him. We thank you for him. We pray in his name. And all of us said together, amen. Let's now take a few moments at the beginning of our time together and express our thanksgivings to God and to also freely confess our sins to God. We remember your great goodness to us, Lord. It was no messenger or angel, but your very presence that saved us. Let's now take a few moments and offer to God our thanksgivings. I would also invite you to perhaps, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, uh, to put in the comments things this Christmas that you are especially thankful for. In love and pity, you redeemed us. You lift us up and carry us all our days. And for these reasons, we now come into your presence confessing our sins to you. For you desire truth in our inward being. Teach us wisdom in our secret heart 
Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Our reading from the Gospels this first Sunday of the Christmas season comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. I was glad when I saw this reading was scheduled for uh, this first Sunday of Christmas because we're all so familiar, and rightfully so, with Luke 2, 1 to 20. But then sometimes there's paragraphs after that in the same chapter that we seem to just skip over and move on to Jesus and his baptism and the temple and the wilderness and all of those fun, exciting things. But there is a very significant story, two very significant characters to Luke's Christmas story that we encounter together today in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of King Jesus. The text that I'd like us to pay attention to together today is found in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7, and the title of my sermon for this first week of the Christmas season is Holding the Body of Christ with Care. Holding the Body of Christ with Care. Would you pray together with me for a few moments? The grass withers. The flowers fall. The word of our God remains forever. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, you are our redeemer. And all of us said together, 
Amen. How do we hold the body of Christ with care? Almost 19 years ago, I held my first baby girl for the first time. And of all the things that frightened me the most as we prepared for her to be born was not so much getting to the hospital, was not so much being worried about the process of delivery. I was going to let you, Linda, worry about that and never express any of my concerns about that. But I'll admit to you that I was really very nervous about being able to hold this baby for the first time. I had seen on television fathers being handed their firstborn child, and it was such this moment, and I was deathly afraid of this because I was very nervous about holding this fragile, delicate baby girl. Aylin barely weighed seven pounds. We were so anxious to have her born that when Yulinda went two days beyond her due date, we asked, could we schedule an induction because we were so anxious to welcome her into the world. So she was born probably a little earlier than she wanted to, thanks to the miracle of Pitocin. Many mothers out there probably say, I don't know that I would regard it as a miracle or a blessing, more as a curse. But yet she was born and she was very, very small. And I still remember as she was born and as the nurses were cleaning her up, there really wasn't much of a cry she just laid there in the little incubator thing that they put the babies in, and she just looked around with these giant eyes. And then obviously they wanted to hand her to Eulinda first, but then still there was this strange transition of getting to hold this baby for the first time and just wondering, how do you do it? Got to make sure you hold the head. And I'd been taught in a class to scoop it up like a football, and, and it was just this strange, frightening time. That image comes to mind as I especially read this gospel reading, and as we consider this question together, how do we, like Simeon, hold the body of Christ with care? At the beginning of Jesus' earthly life and at the end of Jesus' earthly life, Luke describes for us two faithful men who held the body of Christ kind of two bookends on Jesus' earthly life that I think Luke wants us to emphasize these two Jewish men holding the body of Christ. The one you may not be thinking of is Joseph of Arimathea. At the end of Jesus' earthly life, Jesus, uh, Luke describes it this way, Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action to crucify him. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. As Luke narrates these events, you can see that he's wanting us to recall images from the beginning of Jesus' earthly life and the end and, and see kind of this seamless garment. And then as we read, Simeon, who had been in the temple for so long, Luke describes it this way again, guided by the Holy Spirit, Simeon came into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, circumcision and some purification rituals, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, you are now dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Can you imagine being in the temple that day? Almost 19 years ago, I held my first baby girl for the first time. And one of the things that I learned very quickly as family came to the hospital to visit, as my pastor and his wife came to the hospital to visit, 
as different friends from our church family and, and from our college family came to visit, that if you're holding your baby girl and there's people around, you're probably not going to hold her very long because what happens? Other people want to hold that baby close to them. A dear friend of mine, a local pastor, Wayne from Salem Evangelical Lutheran Church mentioned that he had a grandchild born and it took months for it to be able for him to be able to hold it but he spoke of in August in his backyard holding this grandchild for the first time just for a minute for the sake of the baby's health and he described weeping as he held his grandchild there is something about when we love the people who have received this baby when we love this baby and all that it represents and all of the hope for its future, what do we want to do? We want to hold that baby. What would, have, what would it have been like to be at the temple that day and to, after Simeon holds the baby and after Mary and Joseph hold baby Jesus? What would it have been like to hold that baby? That, for us now, is an unrealistic question, but I do think we can still consider this question, how can we? Hold the body of Christ with care. Galatians 4, 1 to 7 confronts us with this question because in a mystical, spiritual way, Paul wants the Galatians to hold the body of Christ, the church, in a way that's characterized by care. And to do so, he's going to remind them of the story of Christmas. So what is... Paul writing to the Galatians. To understand what Paul is writing, we need to first understand why Paul is writing. There's a couple of things just to remind you of about why Paul is writing. Some in Galatia are deserting the gospel and the one who first proclaimed it to them. If you have a copy of God's word with you, which I hope that you do, look at verse 6 of chapter 1. The apostle says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Some in Galatia are deserting the gospel and the one who first proclaimed it to them. Now, what does it mean for them to desert the gospel? To understand a little bit more background, look a page over in chapter 2, starting in verse 15. We ourselves, Paul says, are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet, we know that a person is justified, not by works of the law, but through, literally, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by, literally, the faithfulness of Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. So how are they deserting the gospel and the one who first proclaimed it to them? What they are doing is they are forcing conformity rather than Christian unity. To understand a little bit more about this, look at verse 11 in chapter 2. Paul's going to tell a story, and he's kind of going to throw his good friend Peter under the bus. I'm not sure they were that great of friends. But what we see Peter doing in this paragraph is a hint at what was happening in the church at Galatia. Galatians 2, verse 11, But when Cephas, that's another name for Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. Very strong language. For until certain people came from James, he, Cephas, used to eat with the Gentiles. So here's a Jewish man who, because of the new covenant, because of a vision that's recorded in Acts, he's willing to share a table with Gentiles. That's a big deal in the first century culture. That means Peter, up until these other people had come, Peter was willing to say to Gentile believers in Jesus, these are my people. These are my family. This is my tribe. But after they came, it says, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. That's just a rhetorical word for this Jewish group of believers who come in and see, Peter, what are you doing sharing table 
with Gentiles. And Peter, as he's prone to do, responds to their pressure and pretends to not be in a peaceful relationship with them. Verse 13, and the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Verse 14, and this is key, beloved. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? So here's what Paul's saying. Peter, your behavior by refusing to share a table, by refusing to regard as family other Gentile believers in Jesus because of this cultural pressure, that is not in line with the gospel. So again, the fact that some in Galatia are deserting the gospel doesn't mean necessarily only about what they're teaching, but it has to do with their behavior. More specifically, their behavior at table, that they are not willing to be one family in Jesus. They're letting the patterns of the world tell them who they are. So to kind of summarize um, a really big biblical studies point, I'd like to share a brief quote with you from Scott McKnight. He's a professor at Northern Baptist Seminary um, here near Chicago. He says this, Paul's mission was not to get Gentiles saved, but to get saved Gentiles to live at peace with saved Jews. Now, brothers and sisters, I invite you to consider what he says in light of your understanding of Paul, to read Paul's letters with this understanding that not only does he proclaim the gospel to Gentiles who don't believe, but he also proclaims to believing Jews and believing Gentiles, be at peace with each other. So that's a little bit of background of why Paul is writing to the Galatians now. Let's talk specifically about now what he's going to say in chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. In this paragraph in chapter 4, here's what Paul te teaches. Those accepted by Christ are full sons and heirs of God's promise to Abraham. Those accepted by Christ are full sons and heirs, inheritors of God's promise to Abraham. Now, we read that, and especially if we have some familiarity with, with Pauline theology and New Testament studies, we think, yeah, that's, that's a pretty clear principle. But yet we have to understand that that is such an outrageous claim, one for Paul to be making, and then for him also to be declaring this to these Jewish believers where he's now saying, you need to lay aside your ethnic identity and lay aside this notion of the world being divided into Jew and Gentile, and then confess with Paul, if you belong to Christ, Galatians 3.29, then you are Abraham's seed, heir according to promise. And that's the theological foundation for what he's going to say in verse 28. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So that's kind of this big theological drop mic moment for the Apostle Paul. And then now in our text, Galatians 4, 1 to 7, he's going to tease this out a little bit more and give us truths that we need to believe. If I am going to regard that person, as a full son of God, and as an heir of the promise made to Abraham. So, let me give you a little bit of an illustration of what Paul is asking. And just so I cannot have a reputation for always using sports illustrations, I'd like to again subject you to the gospel according to Downton Abbey. So there's kind of this monarchial feel. Okay, so we're in England, Great Britain. You've got kind of this monarchy form of government, okay? So you've got Lord Grantham, 
And as is often the case in these stories, Lord Grantham doesn't have a son, but he has these daughters. But then he finds this distant cousin. His name is Matthew Crawley, and he can legitimately be an heir. And if he could just get Matthew to marry Lady Mary, I know this is getting confusing, then all of the, the, the wealth of, of the Grantham, all Downton Abbey, everything can stay in the family, and this royal way of doing things can continue. Well, as the writers of Downton Abbey would have it, Lady Mary and Matthew Crawley fall in love, and they get married. Now, Turn off the sound if you want to watch Downton Abbey later because I'm going to give you give away some big, huge um, spoilers here, okay? At the end of one season, I want to say it's maybe season three, okay? Warning, spoiler alert, he dies. And then everything is kind of thrown into a tailspin. Now, I just kind of want to give you an image here. So you've got Matthew and Lady Mary getting married. That means Matthew is going to get to become Lord of Downton Abbey. And there's kind of like, that's the inner circle. And then on the other extreme of this family is a character named Tom Branson. Tom Branson is an Irish socialist. Dun, dun, dun. Tom Branson falls in love with Lady Sybil. Lady Mary's younger sister, they elope. He takes Lady Sybil away. And then in some understood drama, they come back. And then they live at Downton Abbey. And then slowly but surely, because Tom Branson has married Lady Sybil, he is now kind of somewhat accepted into the family. And not only that, but he is a son, and in some ways almost adopted by Lord Grantham. But it's interesting as you watch the series between Lady Mary, between Tom, between Lord Grantham and all of his family, and then Tom, there is always this kind of this opposition. But then slowly but surely, compromises are made, and he becomes this fully understood member of the family what Paul's saying in, in this letter is, within the body of Christ, there's no Tom Bransons. In other words, there's no like somewhat regarded, you're, you're, you're barely in, there's no second class family members. So you've got Lord Grantham, Lady Mary, and their side of things who are very committed to the monarchy. And then you've got Tom Branson, who is very committed to socialism. And slowly but surely, they become one family. In a similar way, what Paul is doing in Galatians is he is describing the church as a way where we don't consider those worldly categories. And Christ is enough to bring us together. That's a provocative ask for the Apostle Paul to give the Galatians but he gives them truths that if they believe these truths, they will then find it supernaturally in their power to regard Gentiles and for Gentiles to regard Jews as siblings in Christ. The first truth they must believe is we are all equally enslaved. All of us are equally enslaved. My point is this. He's going to expound on what he said at the end of chapter 3. Heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are the owners of all the property, but they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So with us, and then in the emphatic position, we, while we were minors, were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. What Paul is saying here is, what is true of what the Jews in Paul's day regarded about the Gentiles is also equally true of them. Jews in Paul's day had this view that these pagan Gentiles were enslaved 
to these elemental spirits of the universe, this idea that there's these spiritual beings that are ordering things and structuring things, and those poor pagans, they are enslaved to those things. Now what Paul's going to do is say to his Jewish brothers and sisters that what had happened is those elemental spirits of the universe had used religion, had used the law to enslave the people of God under the Old Covenant, just like they believed that pagans were enslaved. So to understand that I can regard somebody who in many ways in worldly terms is very different than me, I can consider a full sibling and an heir of the inheritance that, 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 that I am owed also, I must first believe that we are all equally enslaved. The second thing I must believe is that we are all equally desired by the Father. Four to six. But when the fullness of time had come, so we're all enslaved, the irreligious people are enslaved to the elemental spirits of the wor word. The religious people are enslaved to religion. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. Born of a woman, born under the law in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We are all equally desired by the Father. What Paul is going to say, and he brings in Christmas to say, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem even religious people and also irreligious people, to make them sons and daughters of God. God sent his son and his spirit to religious people and to irreligious people, to moral people and people who don't know what a morality is. God sent his son and his spirit, the triune God, desires all of us, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, to make us full adopted sons with rights to the inheritance. So how do I do that? How do I regard all of us as equally enslaved? Because to be honest with you, it's easy for us to think, well, well, yeah, but yeah, but Paul, they're more enslaved than me. Paul says, no. How? How can I learn that? The answer is found in verse 7. So, he's going to go back to singular now. You are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then also an heir through God. I love how he brings it down to the singular because, in other words, he knows that in order for me to accept those whom Christ has accepted, I have to learn myself to be accepted. That the answer is not changing my perspective on them, but changing my perspective on them because when I refuse to accept them, What's being revealed is I'm really not trusting that God has accepted me. Paul Tillich was a Protestant theologian who was born in Poland. And then as the Nazis began to move towards Poland, Hitler heard about this theologian who was preaching about grace and the image of God in all people. And he actually fired him from his job. Thankfully, some American theologians had read some of Paul Tillich and offered him a position at a seminary in New York, allowing him to then be freed from what could have been a very difficult situation. He, and these words, I think, come to my mind whenever I read a lot of what Paul has to write about grace. Paul Tillich says this, Do we know what it means to be struck by grace? It strikes us when... Year after year, the longed-for perfection of life does not appear. When year after year, the longed-for perfection of life does not appear. When the old compulsions reign within us as they have for decades. When despair destroys all joy and courage. 
Sometimes at that moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted, you are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you, and the name, and the name of which you do not know. Do not ask for the name now, perhaps you will find it later. Do not try to do anything now, perhaps later you will do much. But not seek for anything. Do not perform anything. Do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. Brothers and sisters, I believe that this word that Paul spoke to the Galatians thousands of years ago, within it, a word is being spoken to us. Two words, I think, that this text is speaking to us, the first of which is this. We cannot hold the body of Christ with care. So think of Simeon holding the baby Jesus. Think of Joseph of Arimathea holding the dead body of Jesus. We cannot hold the body of Christ with care and disregard the church. One of Paul's favorite labels for the church is the body of Christ. Just not in his letters, but also in the Gospels, Jesus draws this connection, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, between his disciples and himself. He tells us in Matthew 10, whoever welcomes a disciple welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus himself saying that as you show hospitality to a disciple, you are showing hospitality to me. Brothers and sisters, that person that you find it hard to accept. And again, remember that what that reveals is that you're not so sure you're accepted. That ultimately, when we refuse to accept others, when we judge and condemn others, what that reveals is we think that somehow our obedience or our not like that person, the things about us that are different than that person we try to accept, we think that those things about us make us acceptable to God, which means that we are doubting our own acceptance. So that person that you're finding it difficult to accept, a sibling, a coworker, that person whose political sign you disagree with, that person in the shopping aisle that you're finding it difficult to love, we must understand that that person is part of the family that the Father sent the Son and the Spirit to help create. That person, that younger sibling, that older sibling, that spouse with whom you have conflict, that ex-spouse with whom you hold with disdain the thought of them, that childhood enemy is part of the family the Father sent the Son and the Spirit to rescue. Derek Webb, in a folksy song called The Church, puts these words in the mouth of Jesus, I have not come for only you, but for my people to pursue. You cannot care for me, Jesus says, with no regard for her. If you love me, you will love the church. Brothers and sisters, we cannot hold the body of Christ with care and disregard the church. The second word I think Christ is speaking to us through Paul's word to the Galatians is, we cannot hold the body of Christ with care and promote partisanship. Look at Galatians 3, starting in verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. He is saying that the, the world that's passing away has these categories that it wants the church to use to divide people up. 
And what Paul is saying now is the fact that God has sent his son and his spirit to create one family that we don't look to these earthly categories to figure out who we are. We instead look to King Jesus. The church that focuses upon the categories of the age that is passing away is a church that has deserted the grace of Christ and has turned to a different gospel. Brothers and sisters, one of the more discouraging things for me personally, recently and maybe in all of 2020, has not so much been the bickering and the anger and the lies and the profanity and the disparaging comments that our elected leaders have been making about each other. What has been most discouraging for me is seeing Christians start to reflect the image of the politicians for whom they voted. Brothers and sisters, kind of a close second, difficult things for me in 2020 has been how much time I've had to spend online. Because we aren't able to meet in person, I'm having to spend more time using Facebook, using different internet tools and stuff. And you get things that come up in your Facebook feed like, you might know this person, you might know this person, you might know this person. And every once in a while, I'll see somebody who was a grown-up when I was a child. Sometimes I'll see even grown-ups who taught me in Sunday school in this very building, who will engage in political rhetoric with profanity because what they are doing is they are living according to the categories of the age that is passing away. Brothers and sisters, when we turn toward the ways of partisan politics, brothers and sisters, when churches turn towards the ways of partisan politics, when churches sound more like cable news networks than they do Jesus ethic in the Sermon on the Mount, those individuals and those churches have deserted Christ and the gospel of grace that is contained therein which is why I think the word that King Jesus is speaking to us through this text that Paul wrote to the Galatians is, we cannot hold the body of Christ with care and promote partisanship. Brothers and sisters, to hold the body of Christ with care, we must understand that Emmanuel means God with us, and it also means God with them too. It means God with the person we disagree with politically. It means God with the person who looks different than me. It means God with those whom Christ has come to rescue. May the Spirit of God who hovered over the waters of creation, who overshadowed Mary that the word of God would become flesh, grant us the desire and the ability to hold the body of Christ with care. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you grant justice to your chosen ones who cry to you day and night. So we pray always and do not lose heart. Protecting God, you come among us, bringing peace to earth in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. You call us to trust and not be afraid. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us.
in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. You strengthen the hearts of the poor. We pray for our community and for our neighbors. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. In your love and pity, you have redeemed your people. We pray for the church in all places that we may bear witness to your reign of justice, peace, and joy. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You establish equity and justice. We pray for the world, for all who are ensnared in greed, violence, and oppression. In your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. We offer you other concerns we carry in our hearts. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. God of prophetic promise, your radiance penetrates our wintry night. Come to us in tender compassion that we too may walk the path of peace in holiness and without fear. We pray in the name of the one whose birth a heavenly host heralded. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Merry Christmas. Thank you for celebrating with us at this online gathering. I now invite you to receive this closing benediction. Now to God who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed. And through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever, and all of us said together, Amen. May grace and peace be yours.